Thank you. Oh, Night Divine, uh, before I get reading, the passage that I'm about to read is always amazing. Sometimes we need to look at it more than just at this time of year. It is absolute a time of miracles. Basically, every line of scripture is, is another miracle going on. And prophecy, prophecy after prophecy gets fulfilled through this time, and it's just... It's an accumulation of history coming together, and it's a fulcrum of time when Christ arrives on the earth. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 8 to 20. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped and lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went from then into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And so are we. Greg? I agree. I agree, Peter, with uh, your comments about that. Um, it is a wonderful passage of Scripture. In fact, this morning, even though we're, it's Christmas morning, and Merry Christmas, everyone, and uh, yeah, um, we're going to look at this, not only from the fact that it's a great message that the shepherds heard, that they were given, but also from the from the standpoint of, we're going to look at it from the standpoint of the message that they had to give. In fact, I was thinking about it, I mean, we talk a lot about mangers, we talk about wise men, everybody loves the wise men even though they came along a couple years later. We talk about, uh, we talk about people or other characters in this, we talk about the angels and we talk about the singing and we talk about... Uh, you know, silent nights and all these wonderful thoughts and ideas, but we don't really talk about shepherds. I mean, they get mentioned, right? They're usually just standing there. They don't have a speaking role many times. Uh, you know, maybe once in a while we, we let them share their story in a children's program or something like that. But, but the fact is, is that, well, these humble servants were pivotal in this message. I mean, when you read the whole story, you see that Mary ponders these things in her heart. She's affirmed in the fact that, that the Messiah has truly come. Like, she had dreams about it. She had uh, affirmation from her, um, from her cousin. She had all these different things that happened to her to make her understand and realize that this was something very special, not to mention the fact that she didn't understand even how she got pregnant in the first place. But then when the shepherds come, I mean, she's got to be thinking, okay, we're in, we're in a barn, and you know how, how can this be the right thing for God to come to earth? 
And the shepherds come and they reaffirm it with their story and their message. And I, I, guess, I guess what I'm saying this morning is, is that the shepherds had a message to share. It was their obligation, their duty to go share it. And the thing is, it hasn't changed in all these years. As we've been talking about looking at the things that the Bible says about how the end is is near and how we can see things that are happening in our world that certainly make us feel like, man, this, how much longer can we sustain this? What our world needs is hope more than anything. And we have the message of hope on Christmas Day. I'm going to open in prayer and, and then we'll get into this. Lord, we thank you for this message of hope and this love that you have for all of us, for all mankind. Your desire for us to be whole and to be in a right relationship with you and, and to not have sin as a barrier to being able to know you and, and to follow you and not have sin destroy our lives, but, but have the opportunity to know peace and joy and hope and freedom from the burden of sin that really weighs down the world that we live in. And we see these things happening and, and we say to ourselves, it can't be long, but, but Lord, can we really afford not to share the hope that we found in You? And so I pray this morning that as we celebrate this with our family and friends, as we think about these wonderful thoughts that come to us every year at this time and, and all these things, may we not lose sight of this blessed message and this glorious hope that we have to share with our world. The true meaning of Christmas. And help us to do that, Lord. We ask this in Your name. Amen. The children's program last week was about this great message that we have to share. And so kind of in keeping with that, we move forward in looking at the shepherds and, and what they did. So we're not going to skip over the rest of the story. In fact, I looked and last year I preached on Luke chapter 2 and probably the year before that I preached on Luke chapter 2 and I probably, I've been here for 20 Christmases or so, so I've probably preached on Luke chapter 2 a lot. When we look at the shepherd's life, though, we, we're just looking at people, right? Just normal people. And you see this story, and they're out in that same region. It says there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. They, they were doing something that they do every night. Every night, the sheep need to be watched. Somebody needs to be vigilant. They oftentimes have to group them into some sort of a makeshift corral, in, any, in whatever part they were in. It was really arid. The climate was, you know, it's sparse. When I go hunting out in Montana, they can sustain, they need like one acre to, or um, uh, like 20 acres to sustain one cow out there. And so that's why they have such big tracts of land, even way back in the day. That's why the government gave them huge tracts of land, because that was the only way that you could raise enough food to even live out there. And you think about their climate, they had to move all over the place in order to find uh, grass for the sheep to eat. And so at any given time, they could be in a different area. But they happen to be in this area. They happen to be near Bethlehem. That's why it says, and in the same region. So there were shepherds in that region. There might not have always been shepherds in that region, depending on the time of year or how many other shepherds were in that area. But these people were there. These shepherds were there. And we often think to ourselves in our lives, well, what can I do? I mean, I'm just a regular person. I don't know much about the Bible. I don't know uh, all the right things or the wrong things to say to somebody. How can I make a difference in the world. I'm, I'm just here and I'm just hoping that I don't mess up too badly, right? That's kind of, that's what our hope is. is I, I just hope I don't mess up. 
And yet, really, if we have a diagnosis for the world and we're unwilling or unable or, or, or just, just feel like we can't share that message with them, I mean, really, that's, that's a poor stewardship of a hope that we've been given that nobody else or others don't have. And in our world, well, we can see that there's many people who live without hope, can't we? So these are just people doing life, and we think, what can I do, or how can God use me? And the answer to that question is, He can use your story. That's what these shepherds had. They had a, show, a story to tell. It was an amazing story. I mean, we think to ourselves, if I would have seen angels and bright light and the glory of heaven, and I'm in the middle of the desert, like, you know, this, we do this night after night after night. This has never happened before. I've never heard anybody telling about how this has happened to them. Only stories from ancient times of things where God did amazing miracles. And here we are, mere shepherds, experiencing it. And what I want to challenge us all with is that we've all experienced a miracle if we've seen Christ. If we understand who Christ is. If we realize what Christ has done for us. And we live with a hope. Sometimes we've lived with it so many years, we don't even understand what it is to feel hopeless about life. That's a miracle. That's a blessing. And some of us have stories. I mean, some of us think, well, my story wasn't that spectacular. I mean, mine wasn't very spectacular. I kind of, the fireworks all happened later in life. When I started rebelling from God, then, then some things. But there are other things that have happened in my life since then. There are amazing things that God has done. My wife and I, we've, people have bought us houses and given them to us. That's crazy, right? They just felt compelled of God to go out and spend a half a million dollars on a house and give it to us. Well, to the church. But it gave us a place to live. And, and the miracles could go on and on and on that we've seen God do. Probably one of the most astounding ones, you think, well, that's pretty amazing. But the most astounding one I remember was one day we were out at Bible college and we literally like had nothing left to eat. I, I know you're like, come on, right? No, we were, we were out of money. We were out of food. We didn't, well, I was a full-time student uh, we were making our living here and there and different little tasks. And, and my wife said we prayed about it, you know, as we always did, and God always provided something along the way. But Christy says, you know, we should go check the mailbox. I had already checked it that day. It was on campus. You had to walk across campus. I didn't feel like doing that. But we did, and I walked across campus, and and I'm like, it doesn't matter if, if somebody sent us money because people would do that. They knew we were out here at college, in college and, and didn't have much. And, and so people were always generous to send something every once in a while. And I, I remember saying, there's no way that there's, you know, like we can't even cash a check. It's too late to go to the bank. Now, I don't recall if we were going to be, you know, like, hungry there might have been some cheese or something in the fridge I don't know but you know it wasn't going to be it wasn't going to be spectacular that's for sure and I went to that post office box and I opened it up and there was an envelope in there sure enough and I opened up the envelope and there was a $20 bill in it and I just remember that and it's like that is God that's God we prayed he answered. And he answered it before we prayed. That, that's a whole other sermon, isn't it? But anyway. But those are the things, those are the gifts of God every day that I can share with people that I come in contact with. 
That's how God can use me. That's how God can use you. Just any everyday people. And you know, I like it because they were just doing their job. Like, how many of us feel like, oh, I'm in this dead-end job, and I'm, it's going nowhere, and I want to make a difference in the world? Hmm, that's a pretty big difference, right? Seeing angels, sharing that story with Mary and Joseph, celebrating and worshiping with them, rejoicing over what God had done. Another thing, these, these shepherds, one of the things that made them maybe unique, and you think to yourself, well, they're just regular people. They're just doing what they're supposed to do. They're going through the motions of every day. Day after day after day, they do this. They were, what made them different? What made them unique? And, and what I would say is this, that they were people that revered God. So, it says, an angel, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. That idea of fear, you know, we talk about it all the time. Fearing uh, God and, and what that really means. I mean, the fact is, is that when I grew up, I, m- my father loved me. I loved my father we had a fine relationship. It was a great relationship. And I feared my father. Like, my mother's greatest go to was wait till your father gets home, right? And, and we can all laugh about that because that's a, that's a true statement for many of us. Now, I was not afraid of my father, but I feared what my father would think, what punishment I might get, what I might have to do without, you know, whatever it is. But I understood that he held the keys to that, right? He was the one that made those decisions. He was the one that was in charge of my blessings or my curses, if you will. And I understood that. And the same thing goes for God. We fear Him or we revere Him, don't we? Because He's greater than we are. Now, some people don't believe that. Some people believe that God's just their buddy. You know, I talk to God all the time. Yeah, we just, we hanging or whatever. I don't know. That was a poor attempt at whatever that was. But anyway. But, you know, Do we revere God? Do we understand that our lives hang in the balance and our eternity hangs in the balance based upon Him? Because that's a reverence. That's a respect. That's an understanding of who He really is. Here's one thing that I've observed. People that seek their own greatness do not revere God. When people seek their own greatness... They're looking at the world from the standpoint of, I have to do this. I have to take care of this. I have to fix this. I have to solve this. Or I am the one that's going to be great, going to be famous. And here's the things that I'm going to do to get there. Greatness oftentimes keeps us from being able to see who God really is and His necessity for our lives. And so we forget about God. And when we forget about God, we don't revere Him anymore. When He no longer holds the key or the solution to our challenges in life, we don't fear or revere God. And honestly, what that really means is is that a person can't revere God if they're not humble. Humility is such an important thing, and when I look at our world, I don't see any of it out there. I don't see gratitude. I see people who are just out to take what they can. And they need to understand this idea of humility that God provides for us. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. That is not the message in our world, right? 
humble myself before God, and I'll let him take care of the exalting. He'll be the one that'll lift me up. Not me. Not my demands. Not my great intelligence. None of those things is going to work. Humbling myself before God and letting him exalt me, that, that is really what we all need to learn. Matthew 5.3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, you know, all the things that you can gain by your own efforts and your, and your own attempts, all the things that you can get, all the things that you must do, they don't compare to heaven, do they? Ultimately, being in the presence of God is what we were made for. That's how Adam and Eve were created. They were put in the garden. They were in the presence of God. They walked with him every day. I don't know. The Bible, the story goes so fast, I don't know how many days that was. You know? It's like day one, he created this. Day two, he created that. Day three, four, five, six, seven. Then he rested. He created man. And there you go. Next thing you know, they're hiding from God. Didn't take long. But the fact is, is that men have been hiding from God ever since. And the reason Jesus came is to solve that problem. To give us a relationship with Him that is missing from our lives. And so you wonder why our world's so upside down and why things are so messed up. Well, this is the reason. Because we pursue our own interests over the interests of God. And therefore, and thereby, we rob ourselves of the joy of being used of God for His glory. Which is exactly what we were created for. That's it. That's it. All the other things, they're superfluous. They're not, they're not valuable in the greater scheme of things. They're they're, they're valuable for uh, helping us to enjoy life while we're here on this earth. They're valuable many times for us to be able to have the joy of seeing our children grow. But if all those things, anything, our job, our, our, um, uh, our, sorry, our career or whatever it is, any of those things steal from the joy that we get from knowing God, if they become greater than Him... If we put other gods before Him, which is literally the first commandment, then we end up with really a meaningless existence. So people that are seeking their own greatness don't revere God. And one of the reasons is, is because we just get so busy, there's little thought of God in our daily lives, right? Some of us might say, but God has never given me a sign. Like, I haven't seen that big sign. But as I pointed out to you, all of us that know Christ as Savior, we've all been given a sign. It's amazing what God has done for us. Romans 5.8 says, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even while we were still sinners. That's how much He loves us. God shows His love for us. Romans 5.11 says, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation that's a fancy way of saying we have been restored in our relationship with God through Christ Jesus why is Christ Jesus so important why is Jesus so important why is his coming to this earth at this time celebrated because it's through him that we have a relationship with God that's it Jesus said it the best, he said, <laughs> no man comes to the Father but through me. That's the only way you can have a relationship with God. You can look for it in many other ways. You can meditate. You can whatever it is. But you're not going to find a relationship with God in any other way but through the blood 
of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. What kind of people were these shepherds, these people that we seem to think, you know, what a great thing happened to them. They got to be a part of the Christmas story forever. But nothing like that's ever happened to me. Well, you know what? It really wouldn't be much of a Christmas story if they didn't go. Right? When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. They went, right? They went to Bethlehem. They were people that went. They're people that go. What kind of people are we? Are, are we people that go? Are we willing to go? I mean, you know, that's, it's not really the same illustration, but as in my story of having to go to the mailbox, I mean, I didn't even want to go to the mailbox. And I'm still that way. Like, if I can figure out a way not to go out to the garage for something. Like, the other day I was up and down the basement, everywhere, looking for a Phillips, or a, you call it a star bit, screwdriver. Okay? I say you because I'm from the States, and I never heard a star bit before, but Philip Screwdriver. I don't know who Philip was, but I don't know who Robertson was either, so <laughs> I use their stuff, though, all the time. But I'm, I'm searching all over, the, and I'm, all of a sudden, I'm like, you are stupid. Like, put your shoes on, go out to the garage and get one. You got 20 of them in there, but there's got to be one in here so I, don't have to, so I can stay in my slippers, you know? I'm, I'm comfy here. And lazy, yes, that's it. Yes, was, was that Christy? Where's, oh, oh, okay, all right, thanks. Yeah. Are you filling in for her? There you go. But these were people that went, and they said, hey, let's go. I don't know what happened to the sheep. I don't know if they were like, ah, we don't care about the sheep anymore. I don't know who drew the short straw and had to stay back with the sheep. You know, but this message was too good. We got to go. And I, I don't know. I mean, maybe they, I, I don't know. Maybe they waited for reinforcements, but it seems like they found the baby in the manger, so they must have went right away. Jesus told his disciples to go too, didn't he? He said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That, that is... The message, that's one of the last things he said to them, is go do this. Go make disciples. Go tell others about this. We have a great story to tell. And, and yet, we're ashamed of it. And I, we live, quite honestly, we, we live in a culture that is getting more and more averse to hearing that message. It's true. It's not as easy to share it as maybe it once was. You know those guys that are walking down your street with the suit and everything in the summertime and you're like, yeah, drawing the blinds closed and, you know, they're going to stop at your door. I mean, one thing about it, I don't agree with their message, but I'll tell you something right now. I mean, they're out there getting it. They're getting it out there, right? Sometimes we're, we won't even cross the driveway. We won't even go to the next door neighbor. Or even sometimes when they come to us and we get in a conversation about who knows, I mean, something they could have lost a loved one or something like that. Do we take the time to say, hey, there's a hope? There is a hope. Jesus told his disciples to go. Here's the thing that, that strikes me about it We're, we are not always willing to let the message alter the course of our lives. We're not always willing to do that. There's a story about that, Jesus, in Luke chapter 9, verses 59 to 62. It says, to another he said, and these were disciples that would be disciples that were kind of following him through the streets and he's talking and stopping and preaching to them. To another one, he said to them, he turned to him and he said, follow me. 
But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Now, sometimes people get confused about this because Jesus' answer sounds really harsh, right? It says, and Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. That's a little heartless, isn't it? Or at least it sounds that way. But you need to understand that the phrase that he was using there was a phrase that would commonly be used like, I need to go and take care of my parents, and when they die, then I'll have time. What he's, what he's in essence saying is, is he says, when I retire, that's what he's saying. When I retire, I'm going to come follow you. I'm going to go do whatever you want me to, Lord. Whatever you want once I retire. You know, I got, I got stuff to do right now. That's what he's, that's what he's saying. Now, that's, that might sound a little harsh. You may have heard those words come out of your mouth before. But the fact is, is Jesus is saying, no, you know what? The whole world is dead in their trespasses and sin. The whole world is separated from God. Like, we don't have a spiritual life without Jesus. Let the dead go bury their dead. Let the dead take care of your parents. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God, which gives us better understanding in the whole thing that he was saying. He was saying, basically, if you live in the past, if you're worried about everything else, all the other obligations of life, you're never going to get to it. It's a message that needs to be shared and it needs to be shared now. Another thing about these shepherds is they were people that just told their story. That's all they did. They just told their story. In verse 16 through 18 of Luke 2, it says, And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered, at what the shepherds told them. All they did was said what their experience was when they encountered God. That's what we were talking about. Like, all of us have a story. We have some story there. I mean, my story, I grew up in a Christian home, and that's really all I knew. When, when, the, when the church doors were open, my grandfather expected the whole family to be there. And, and then he could also tell us about the evils of playing cards and shooting pool. Because, because until he was 30 years old, he spent his time in a bar. And that's just, that's what he knew. And he saw that as the thing that kept him from seeing God. And so, that's what he knew. And, and so for many years, I played Rook. Anybody know what Rook is? You ever heard of that game? Yeah, it's like... It's like Uno. It's it's like it's like Christian Trump uh, uh, spades. That's that's what that's what it basically is. Different cards, so they're all good, right? <laughs> serious. I'm serious. We, that's what we. Anyway, but that's that was his story. My story is, is that by a miracle of God, my grandfather got saved at the age of thirty. And my story is, is that by another miracle of God, my mother, in her efforts of missionary dating, that's what we call it, by the way, when you date somebody who isn't a believer, it's missionary dating, then we just pray they get saved, right? Otherwise, when you get married to them, then you're going to just be praying they get saved even more, you know? I mean, we, anyway... But my dad, like by the time I came along, he was teaching Sunday school. But when he met my mother, he was nowhere near that. And his family was something miraculous to be saved from. And, and I, I want you to realize that that is a God story in itself. Because these two raised me. And why was I born there? And why was I born to them? And how is it that God is so kind that I didn't have to experience any of those experiences? I mean, I, I, like I said, I had a rebellious phase where I tried, but that's a different story. 
People got to tell their story. That's all we got to do. That's what we have. Is we have the story that God gave us. And how many of us, our story may sound really bland. Just like I felt like, you know, another Christmas sermon was going to sound, to be honest. But we, we think to ourselves, my story just sounds really generic, really cliche. It's just normal. There's nothing special about it. And maybe there's somebody out there that needs to hear your unique story because it'll resonate with them. Not because it's special. Not because it was amazing. That's, that's the world's value system that everything's got to be incredible. God's value system is, you share the story, I'll make it amazing. Okay? And the last thing these people were is they were people that were experiencing the true meaning of life. It says in verse 19, verses 19 and 20, it says, But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. What I want you to understand is that this is what we were created for. They were praising God and glorifying God. And we think to ourselves, well, you know, that's really nice, but like, what's the big deal about that? Well, if you spend your whole life doing something that doesn't bring real meaning to it, then you end up depressed. You end up discouraged. You end up slowly, slowly getting burnt out by the world that we live in. People end up at the end of their lives not understanding why they're even here. Um, Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is kind of an example. It, it, is, it is a valuable resource to look at, but if you've, if you've ever um, studied psychology, it's kind of like, uh, this is very simplified. Those of you who have, um, I'm sorry about that. But, but basically, you have basic needs, right? We need shelter, we need food, we need it to not rain on us every day, or whatever it is. These are all good things, right? And once we experience that, once we get that taken care of, then we can kind of get up to the next level. And then we need safety, right? We need somebody to not steal the stuff that's keeping us from, you know, and we need to, we need to be, uh, we need to have an understanding or a feeling that our life is somewhat secure, and as we go up the ladder, you know, we end up with having to uh, be recognized and esteemed by others. And then when you get to the pinnacle of it, if you get all these things right, if you get the kind of love you're supposed to have and all these other things are in place, then you can be what they call self-actualized. And that's the one part that I don't agree with. I mean, I, I don't know about the esteem part, well... We got plenty of esteem going on in our world today, so I'm not sure that the, the second level is all that great either. But one thing I can say is that that self-actualized part, that's what everybody's trying. They want to have meaning in their life. And when all these other things are in place, then our lives will feel meaningful. And the fact is, is the only thing that's going to make us feel meaningful is bringing glory to God. That's it. It really is. How he esteems me is far more valuable than how I esteem myself or how you esteem me. Isn't that, the, isn't that crazy? I mean, our world, people are crushed by what somebody says. I mean, you know, if, like if you don't like that stuff, just get off so, social media, would you? You know? People there every day just looking to stomp on somebody. That place is toxic. It really is. I don't, if, if your birthday 
If you're expecting, you know, Pastor Craig to send a, a, a birthday greeting to you on your birthday, let me tell you, it will never happen. It'll never, for two reasons. One, because I'm never there. I mean, I, I have a Facebook page somewhere. I, I, I don't know. I haven't been on there. Well, oh, I shouldn't say that because I went on Marketplace this week. See, that's how it works, right? I was looking for something. And, but, but no, other than that, you know, I don't go on there. And I'm not going to see it. And if I do see it, there's no way I'm going to do something. Okay, I'm just going to say this. You're going to be mad, okay? There's no way I'm doing something so lame as wishing you happy birthday because it reminded me to wish you happy birthday. I'm sorry. Just not going to do it. It's crazy. It's like, how meaningful is that? Oh, Pastor Craig's thinking of me. No, I just hit a like button or whatever, right? Because it's your birthday. And you came up on my news feed. So if I say happy birthday to you, it's not because I found it on Facebook, number one. Number two, it's an amazing miracle of God, which you might want to tell somebody else about. Because if I remembered your birthday, I'm lucky if I remember your name, but if I remembered your birthday, that's amazing. Right? <laughs> rejected him in the past or whatever it is, wherever you're at, if you don't know him, for you ever. The greatest gift has come to this world to give us life, to give us hope, to give us meaning, to give us a future.